right. Okay. Um, so I wasn't sure at all what to talk about uh, today. Um, so in the end, I just decided I was going to talk about one of the things that I'm finding most ex exciting at the moment in research. Um, and actually, coincidentally, and, and just echoing a lot of Jim's comments, there's a lot of links here, uh, potential and actual links between what we're doing here and researchers in, in, in Oxford. In fact, just this morning, uh, um, Sebastian Volner and uh, Arno have actually put a, a paper on archive, uh, which is really uh, has very interesting connections to the sort of things that we're working on here. Um, this particular work is, is joint work with uh, uh, Joris Birkins, who's uh, a CRISM research fellow. This is CRISM. This is, um, this is within the Department of Statistics at Warwick. It's the uh, Center of Research and Statistical Methodology. And we have lots of workshops as part of this. And um, uh, he's a postdoc that's employed on, on this. And we had a workshop just two weeks ago um, on, I think, an, a very exciting and emerging theme in exploring high dimensional spaces, which has, has particular applications in, in complex modeling and, and complex statistical modeling. Um, and that's to do with rever non reversible Markov chain Monte Carlo. Okay, so that was the theme of the workshop. And what we're going to talk about today is the zigzag, which is a, a, a method which we've come up with, which is, um, has some interesting connections with processes that are, are in the sort of classical probability literature. Uh, but which we are currently investigating, but seems to have really quite interesting properties, uh, which we're uh, very excited about. Okay, so this is this is joint work with um, um, with Joris, and this thing might work if I'm. Oh, I don't need to put this on full screen, do I? Yeah, that's. Uh, Something I'm doing? Oh. Yeah. <coughs> Don't know quite what's. So I should be telling the joke now, shouldn't I? <laughs> I only know one and you told it already. <laughs> oh, yeah, very good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <coughs> Perfect. Thank you. Thank you so much. <coughs> okay. Um, so this is basically what I want to, um, how I want to sort of try and uh, structure this. Um, I want to just give some motivation. This is not going to be a technical talk at all. I want to give motivation about m why we might be interested in non-reversible Markov chain Monte Carlo. Um, you know, why, what properties of non-reversible Markov chains uh, might have, which uh, might actually be better than sort of uh, standard and perhaps easier to handle and easier to implement uh, reversible Markov chains. So wh why on earth might we want to bother? Um, I'm going to talk something about some ways of doing this, and these are ways which are really have emerged in the last sort of five, five or six years or so. Um, Joris has, has, has done some very nice work bef before and during when he came to, to Warwick uh, on, in this area and others as well, and I'll say something about that. Then I'm going to introduce the zigzag, which, if nothing else, is a fun process. And um, if it works, I'm going to show a video of it, sort of, uh, of how, how it kind of works l uh, um, later on. OK. I'm going to start off, though, with a, with a, 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 a quite classical algorithm that's been around in, in the Markov chain Monte Carlo literature for a long time. Now, imagine this is a complex high dimensional space drawn in one dimension, as we always do. Um, so this is the slice sampler. Um, the idea is we want to have an invariant, we, we, we essentially want to simulate from uh, a, a Markov chain which has invariant distribution, which is given by this density function. Here, here's our density function here. I'm interested in this. The slice sampler, the simple slice sampler, is a very nice Markov chain. It starts, say, from this dot here. And first of all, it me makes a vertical move according to a uniform distribution between 0 and the value of a density. And then when it gets to here, it basically looks at the horizontal slice. So I'm trying to sort of do a horizontal line there. So it simulates from that uniform distribution, and then, in fact, it moved to this point here. And then it continues to do these kind of moves. It's essentially, well, it's exactly just a Gibbs sampler on the distribution um, on, under the graph here. 
Okay, and the marginal distribution of that, if you're just interested in what's happening on the x-axis, is actually a di distribution which has a density proportional to this function that we have here. Now, why do I mention the slice sampler? Well, the slice sampler um, is actually uh, a, an amazingly brilliant algorithm. If you could implement the slice sampler, uh, you'd more or less solve Monte Carlo um, um, problems uh, for good, in, in the sense that um, if you can do the slice sampler, um, uh, uh, then, then you can get algorithms whose convergence times really don't degrade at all uh, with the high dimensionality. That's some that you, you have to implement a certain type of the slice sampler. But what we can say about the slice sampler are some very, very strong, positive theoretical results to say it's very, very good. So what's the catch? The catch is you can't implement it. What can't you implement here? Well, the, 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 um, the vertical slice here is very easy because all you're doing is you have a uniform random variable between zero and the value of a density here. So that's easy enough to simulate from. On the other hand, the horizontal slice, imagine that you really are in a thousand dimensional problem. This is going to be some complex high dimensional space on which the density is actually bigger than or equal to what its current value is. Okay, so, and that is a very complicated uh, uh, simulation to do. It may be a uniform simulation, but just because it's uniform doesn't make it easy. And therefore, the slice sampler in its pure form, and there are many interesting variants of this which are more practical, but in its pure form, the slice sampler is not something which uh, you can very often implement. Very interesting connections here with other modern methods such as the uh, of nested sampling, if, if people have, have, have heard of been working on that, very interesting sort of and, and somewhat controversial algorithm, turns out to have very close properties to the slice sampler. Okay, um, uh, that's, okay, that's, I thought I had more slides than that. <laughs> <laughs> could be using the whiteboard after all. <coughs> There's definitely more slides, guys. We, uh, they were here before, I thought. I wasn't wondering anything, it was, it was just there. <laughs> Don't blame me. <laughs> yeah. I can, I, if, if it helps, I can do without this. Uh, so. No, it's not. I don't know where it is. Is that stick? It's not my stick, no. Okay. No. Is Karen here? Is, is or, or, or Eleanor? Yeah, because um, I don't have a stick. <laughs> no, no, no stick. No stick. <laughs> Yeah, the folder. Yeah, I would go in there. Yeah, with oh, the well, yeah. And, and Gareth, that's yeah, that's yeah. yeah. And so if you uh, go and zigzag, zigzag. Right, yeah. Okay. Brilliant. Thank you very much. <coughs> okay. I think we're sorted, Karen. Thank you anyway. <laughs> just stay, just in case, okay? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, okay. So um, the slice sampler is not something that we can I I implement very easily. Um, but I just want to sort of kind of a, a thought um, experiment to, to sort of think about um, how we might actually try and improve it, at least in, in, in one dimension. So, um, so one thing about the slice sampler, when we're doing these horizontal slices here, what you're doing is you're just basically producing one random draw from the uniform distribution. But in some sense, it would be quite nice if we could sort of 
have all the possible values of, of that set instead of, it's basically take, take all of them with us instead of just essentially taking one uniform draw from that distribution. Somehow that would, if, if people know about the notion of rail blackwellization, somehow that might actually give us a sort of smaller variance. It may be a more efficient, better Monte Carlo method to do. So here's a, here's a sort of, uh, again, a sort of a toy algorithm that you might try and implement. Um, again, this is a, a one-dimensional, uh, and this really is one-dimensional um, um, in, in terms of how you might do it. So what, the, what I'm going to do here is, uh, this isn't sort of a, a Markov chain in quite the same way, although, as, so what we'll do here is, is we'll basically have a uniform random variable. Uh, first thing I'll do is I'll draw a uniform random variable between zero and the maximum value of the, of the density. Okay, and I'm, I'm going to assume that this density is decreasing. And what I'm going to do is that wh then when I do that, I start from this point here on the left-hand side, and then I'm going to send a trajectory, and I'm going to give it constant velocity to move along here as far as it can until it basically hits the density. When it hits the density, I'm going to give it instruction. The instruction is just come back and head back to the beginning again. Okay? Now, if you do that, then when you get back to the beginning again, what do you do? Well, what you do is then you say, I need a new uniform random variable, so throw this one away, get another one, and do exactly the same thing. Okay, it may not be completely obvious to you, but that will give you the, the correct invariant distribution, and the reason it will give you the correct invariant distribution intuitively is that in some sense you could look at this value here and say, well, I don't know how far I'll get here, but what's the chance I get to here? Well, it's essentially going to be this uniform random variable. Okay? If, if that height is 1, it's going to be basically that height there divided by that height. That's going to be the probability that I reach there. So I'm going to reach the, these points around here all the time, and I'm going to reach these points around here with a probability which is proportional to its height, which is exactly what a density is trying to do. So intuitively, it feels right. Mathematically, you can prove that it's, it's, uh, it's doing the right thing. Um, but actually, it's non-reversible. Why is it non-reversible? Because essentially, this thing has a velocity. Uh, it's, a, it's a piecewise, deterministic, stochastic process. It has a velocity, um, and that velocity is constant, and, and, and essentially, it looks different going one direction from the other direction. Okay. So that's, that's an alternative. Okay. Um, okay. So here, here, here's um, just um, things which um, you will have seen before, but this is really for notation more than anything. So as S is a finite set for now, it, it will be not finite later on. Um, P is a tran are transition probabilities of a proposal distribution, and pi is a, is a, is a target distribution. Okay? So I'm interested in simulations from um, pi, and I'm going to use P. P. Um, so um, essentially here, uh, uh, sorry, that should say Q, the proposal distribution. Um, uh, and so the metropolis hastings algorithm, a very general mechanism, um, what it does is it says, well, I'll try and correct this Markov chain, P or Q, whatever it happens to be, in such a way that I have uh, basically the correct invariant distribution. And it does that by accepting the move um, as suggested by Q with a probability which is the minimum of 1, and this ratio pi Q over Q pi. Okay. And so, the, so this, this chain, you can write down exactly what the Markov chain is uh, and the, the overall transition curves. I've got my P's and Q's quite the wrong way around here. Um, so this, should, this, this is essentially the, these are the transition probabilities of the Markov chain. It's the probability that I propose a move from X to Y times the probability that I accept it. And the reason why Metropolis Hastings works very nicely is because it's reversible, okay? And so the condition that we need to check and the fact that it's nice and simple and the fact that it makes it all work is the fact that this is just a local condition. It's just for any X and Y, we just need to check this. A much more complicated condition, um, which we don't need to check, but is, a, is actually as true as a result of this, is the invariant condition, which is the condition that says that if I start at pi and if I move forward one iteration, then I'm still at pi. Okay. Um, so, okay, so I'm, not, I'm going to talk about non-reversible in a minute, but first of all, I just want to motivate it, and I'm going to take a risk, and I'm going to try and show a video. This is the first time I've ever shown a video in a... Or not shown a... Or not shown a this is the first time I've failed to show a video in a... <laughs> okay, okay, so um, I'm just going to show an example of a Markov chain here. 
Okay, so um, so what's happening here? So, so the state space, it works great. Um, so here I have a state space which is essentially uh, a point centered around a circle. Okay, I'm going to have to, uh, I'll show it again in a minute. Um, and basically the, the idea is, is that the size of that circle the size of that circle is proportional to the amount of probability mass there. So you can see that this is a distribution on the circle, but it's not completely straightforward because if you look at here, it's like a multimodal. You've got three modes, you've got a mode here, you've got a mode here, and you've got a mode here. And this is doing some kind of random walk metropolis algorithm, and it's starting up over the right here, and it's essentially staying there. So this is staying in this mode, and it's not jumping to the other modes. And you can sort of see why that's the case, because there's lot, not much probability mass here, there's not much probability mass here, so it's very difficult to actually get between the two, between the three areas. Okay. In fact, it turns out that it's not even, um, you're going to get bored of this in a minute, it's not even the case that this Markov chain works very well, even in the case where you have a uniform distribution around here. Okay. It turns out that even then it's pretty slow by some kind of way, ways of measuring it. So how might we try and make it quicker? Well, one way we might try and make it quicker is to give it some kind of momentum to move around the space uh, in a particular direction. Okay? Give it a shove. Move things around. So uh, if we give it a shove, though, we've got to decide, do we shove it clockwise or anticlockwise? And as soon as we start doing that, it's going to be non-reversible. Okay? It's going to have some tendency to go one direction or the other. Okay, so let's give it a shove. Sorry, I'm a Mac user, so closing windows is on the wrong side. Okay. So let's give it a shove. Uh, this is an anti-clockwise shove, and it works. Okay, it's in, in the scent. Well, it works in the, uh, better than before. You can sort of see that it is actually managing to sort of jump between the various things. So what, ha what we have here is a complicated um, a Markov chain, it's slightly more complicated than, than, uh, than the toy we had before. Um, but something that's actually uh, made better, but there is a kind of cost to that in that we have to look at something more expensive, which is not going to satisfy the detailed balance relationship that you'd get from Metropolis Hastings. If you had Metropolis Hastings, it would satisfy detailed balance, and as a result, it would have to look the same forward than backward. If you look at this one, if I were to run the video backwards, it would basically be going around clockwise as opposed to anticlockwise. So they would look different, and so detailed balance can't apply. Okay, so um, thank you. Uh, okay, so here we go. Um, so here's a metropolis. So how are we going to do that? Well, we don't have much to play with here. Um, but certainly, if we use this acceptance probability, then no matter what the proposal distribution Q is, it's going to make it reversible. So if we're going to change this in some way, we'll have to actually alter the accept-reject in some way. So, um, so this is a, um, a, an, an idea that was introduced by Joris um, in a paper uh, earlier this year. Well, it's really finished last year, to be honest. And the idea is to basically... Uh, modify the accept reject by basically adding in this gamma thing here. And you can't have any old gamma, um, but it turns out that you, you, know, you can actually do um, quite a lot of generality here by just letting uh, gamma here be some kind of skew symmetric uh, operator, but it has to have zero s uh, uh, row sums and column sums. Okay, so anything like that. So, so what that will essentially be doing is it will be basically saying that moves between certain x's and y's will be more likely, but then that the, to compensate for that, the reverse move from y to x will actually be less likely. So then you can basically do the same thing, and I'm not going to prove to you that this, is, that this works. It's actually not very complicated. It, it works uh, uh, not uh, with just a sort of simple calculation. It doesn't satisfy detailed balance, but it does satisfy the invariance equation. Okay. But what's the problem? Uh, so we showed you those examples. Um, so it, it turns out that if you do this on this particular example, and that, uh, that was the example that we used um, for, for the videos, um, uh, we, we get success. Okay? So the non-reversible algorithm does actually improve on the reversible one. So that's very nice. But there's a big problem because 
I actually um, tried to pull the wool over your eyes by saying that I had to basically ensure that um, uh, that, the, uh, that, that this gamma thing here was skew symmetric and had rho sums equal to zero. And remember also that um, this thing must also um, uh, be such that, you know, I can't allow, um, uh, well, the, this, uh, the acceptance probability essentially needs to be a probability. So, um, so I need to be quite careful about uh, everything that's happening here. I certainly can't let it go negative, for instance. Um, so... Um, and there are some restrictions. So here's an example of, of a situation where you really are restricted. Suppose I have no cycle. So I, I have a Markov chain that's just basically going to be on, say, n states, which are just four here. And so the only freedom I've got is in, in choosing the, the, uh, the, the, the rates at which I, I jump from, from here to here or to on back again. It turns out that you can't get non-reversible Markov chains here. Okay. It's uh, very well known that you just can't. These, these are things called birth and death chains, and essentially you can't do this. So that basically you can't satisfy all the constraints and get a gamma which works. So there's no, there's no flexibility at all in, in, order, in able to, 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 to do this. So in, or, in order to get some kind of velocity, what we need to do is to somehow um, make the spa state space a little bit more complicated. Okay, so... What I'm going to do is I'm going to make duplicates of a state space. Uh, and what I'm do, do, doing here is I've got basically duplicates at the bottom. And these duplicates have a property that um, actually they're linked to the original one as well. Okay, So to just think of these as linking the, um, the original copy to the duplicates. Okay. So then we can have this notion of, of, of lifted Markov chains, which lives on a more complicated uh, state space. And lifted Markov chains... Um, oh, it's uh, introduced in this paper. I can't pronounce any of the authors, actually, so I won't even try. <laughs> but it's a very, very good paper. Uh, um, and uh, so, um, the, uh, so, th this, so this is a general form of, 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 of a lifted Markov chain. Um, so suppose we have a, a state space. We have a state space S. And I call it S sharp. And what am I doing is I'm basically giving up myself a minus one or a plus one deciding on whether I, I essentially am in this original copy of the... <coughs> excuse me, sorry. Um, you can edit out the, the C's. Or the, or the negative copy, which is the ones down here. Okay. And um, what, what I do is, is basically the, I need two transition kernels, a, a T plus and a T minus. And the T plus basically determine things that I do when I'm in the plus mode and T minus determine what I do in, when I'm in the, in the minus one. But these are substochastic, allowing for some probability of switching between the two. Okay, so, um, and also, what I, and now I don't satisfy detail balance. I, I satisfy something called skew detail balance, which means that if I look at, the, say, the positive moves from X to Y, starting at, at, at X, that's the same thing as the negative moves from Y to X. Okay, so that's sort of, so this, is, this would be detail balance if T plus was equal to T minus, but basically it's just balancing out the, the plus moves under X and the minus moves under, under Y for a move from X to Y. And then what you have to do is you need to basically decide when you jump from plus to minus and when you jump from minus to plus. And it turns out that the probabilities you need to use uh, look like this. They're basically, um, so that, that probability may be zero if this thing is negative, uh, otherwise, it's going to be this thing, this object here. Okay. So this is a, this is very nice, and it turns out that you can show that the invariant distribution um, in this Markov chain, even though you've got quite a lot of interaction between the uh, positive negative variable and the variable in the S space um, on an iteration by iteration basis, uh, the invariant distribution actually turns out to have two independent components in which you have probability half in each of those two, and then pi in S. So that's very, very nice, and it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a lovely construction. Um, and you can basically, it's very well suited to, to um, um, Markov chain Monte Carlo, because what you can do is you can essentially, um, you can have a complicated space, um, and you can define a quantity of interest eta, which in some sense is defining your sort of directions of which, which directions you'd prefer to move in or not prefer to move in. 
Okay, so eta is just basically mapping onto the real line. And what you should do is basically just do, um, in the plus state, you only propose moves which basically go from, uh, which go to values which increase eta, and vice versa for the minus moves. Okay, and because it's a metropolis and we construct it in the right way, the skew detail balance uh, is automatically going to be satisfied because it's left over from the detail balance that we had from the original metropolis algorithm. Okay, so, so we, this can be imp implemented in, in certain cases. Um, it can have extremely nice empirical properties, but there's, there's a snag. And the big snag of it is that essentially you have um, this uh, expression in the switching probability, and this expression involves a sum over the whole state space. Okay? Now remember that we're doing Monte Carlo in a high dimensional state space because we want to do sums of the whole state space. So it doesn't make sense if we actually have to do a sum over the whole space, state space at every iteration just to know how to implement the Markov chain. So unless you've got nice structure in the Markov chain, and to be fair, uh, often you do, especially in discrete state spaces, this is something which is often uh, uh, very restrictive. What we've done is we've actually looked at this. And originally, we looked at it in, in terms of a sort of very interesting model from statistical physics called the Curry-Weiss model. And um, uh, uh, we were particularly interested in, in that case, and it fitted very well in that case. Um, but you can actually find a very interesting continuous time limit of this if you can speed up time and make um, more and more smaller and smaller jumps. And I'm not going to express that um, um, result um, sort of in, in any sort of mathematical detail, but I'm just going to sort of you know show. So the idea is is that this 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 may be doing a mark the original lifted Markov chain is doing a Markov chain which goes goes to here, goes to here, goes to here, and then actually may may switch down to the other states and then go backwards again. Okay. So if you imagine taking smaller and smaller steps but having taken small and smaller steps, um, your trajectories might look a bit more deterministic. And then you sort of suddenly change back direction. So if you take these smaller steps, but in order to make anything happen, you're going to have to do much more work. So you have to do more steps. So if you speed up time and you sort of look at it, you can show that there's a, there's a limit. And that what the limit looks like um, is this. Okay. And, and, uh, what, what, how, how do these things kind of work out? Well, intuitively, we can reinterpret this. Okay, so we can reinterpret this in the following way. So, so I talked about this, this, this simple example in terms of the uniform random variable. The uniform random variable, um, well, it may seem a bit unsatisfactory to say every time I reach the mode of my distribution, I have to produce uh, a, a, real, um, a, a new uniform random variable from my back pocket. Okay. Instead, I can interpret this as saying, well, what's the probability I get here? I can interpret that as a sort of hazard rate. I can sort of say, suppose I'm traveling along a particle. Imagine yourself sitting on this particle, moving along here, and you've got a hazard rate. And it's a hazard rate of being kind of um, bashed in the face and told to go back where you came from. Okay. And that hazard rate, the correct hazard rate to give you this uniform distribution, and it's a simple calculation, the hazard rate is the maximum of zero and minus the log pi prime, which has some similarities to the switching probabilities that we have from the lifted Markov chain, because that's exactly what it is in the limit. Okay. Okay, so um, for those of you, this is my only slide with any maths on, um, for those of you interested, um, um, so the, 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 the use of the gradient of log pi in algorithms is something that is um, very important. It's very important for many um, sophisticated uh, um, modern-day MCMC algorithms like um, Langevin algorithms and Hamiltonian MCMC algorithms and the like. Um, if you look at uh, diffusion, if you look at the Langevin diffusion, which is the continuous time diffusion which motivates all those algorithms, it essentially looks like this. Here I'm using phi prime as minus the gradient of log pi. Um, so this is the, the um, generator, if you know about generators of, of such a process, and it has a second derivative term in here. 
Here, the zigzag generator essentially looks much simpler. It just has a first derivative, and then this is basically talking about the sort of uh, uh, switching rate. Lambda's the switching rate between the plus or the minus states. So essentially what you're doing in this process is you're moving along, like these trajectories, you're moving along uh, at constant velocity, and then suddenly you're changing direction, and you'll change direction by reference to uh, that gr uh, the, the gradient of log pi in the direction that you're, you're moving. Okay, so this it's a bit of a slide missing, but uh, this is this uh, this kind of stochastic process dates back to uh, something called the telegraph process, which was in introduced, I believe, by Mark Katz in the early 1970s. Um, and that was another of his famous papers. Okay, and uh, um, time's a bit short, so I'm not going to say this. So, but th there's some very very interesting questions about how do you implement this. Um, there are. Um, it turns out that, that this can be implemented really very simply um, by use of, of thin Poisson processes. Um, and I, I'm not going to go into those details um, in, too, in too much detail, except to say that I think, you know, coming back to Jim's comments earlier, um, I want to talk to Louis, for instance, at the back of the, about sort of how you might do this on, on sort of GPUs because, because there are very nice... Um, ways in which you can break up high dimensional simulations of this type um, into kind of separate processes. And there's some very, very nice ideas, very simple ideas, which could perhaps be uh, made very, very quick in high dimensions. So, that, so uh, that's an example in which, again, Warwick and, and Oxford can collaborate. Um, and so I ju ju I'm just gonna show you a couple of, of simple examples. Um, this is on the Cauchy distribution. Um, I'll just show you the one for, for lots of iterations here. So the zigzag process is the purple process here. And um, so th this is a sort of, uh, the black one is a, is a, a random walk metropolis algorithm which doesn't work very well. The zigzag process does much better because it sort of finds the tails of a distribution and then it comes back quite quickly. So it has this, has a sort of uh, nice sort of robust property which um, the random walk metropolis is known to, to, to not be very, very good at. Um, so, so one of the areas it works very well is, is with, with actually um, uh, is, is basically heavy tail distributions. Another thing, it seems to have very strong antithetic properties. Because of this zigzag nature, um, very often Monte Carlo variances are very small compared to what you might expect them to be because it's sort of going everywhere. Um, and it's, sort of, it's deliberately sort of going one place and then coming back. So it's kind of averaging over the two sort of naturally in the way that the sample paths work. Um, okay, we've got lots of work in progress. Um, I'm going to show you one more video uh, in a minute. Um, but basically, in multi-dimensions, in multi -dimensions, there are various ways of doing it. This is what we're working on at the moment because it seems to be very promising. Um, so basically, you have a multi-dimensional um, velocity, okay, giving you basically a sequence of, of zeros and ones doesn't have to be, you can do all sorts of things. You can even make these state dependent, you can make them time dependent or whatever. They're all, there are lots of things which are easily implementable in this, in this sense. Um, so we're working on ways of doing the, this, uh, this uh, uh, sampling efficiently, but in many ways it's simpler than a lot of the sort of diffusion algorithms that people, including ourselves, are, are working on, even though maybe in some ways it's not as powerful. Um, the convergent properties are, 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 in, are very interesting theoretically um, again, and experimentally and, and, and sort of, um, uh, you know, we, and we're be comp comparing these quite a lot to other methods. And it's sort of this slightly provocative comment, can this be a competitor to Hamiltonian MCMC, which seems to do very well on lots of things. Um, uh, so we believe it has many of the similar kind of characteristics and may s somewhat be uh, simpler and may even be a lot better in some situations. We don't know enough to sort of say that for definite, but we certainly think it's worth investigating. Um, I want to finish off by showing uh, one more video. Should be the, um, and this is the banana video. Um, so th this is a, um, an example of a, a, a sampler which, um, uh, on the distribution, the shape of a distribution is sort of like a banana shape. This is like a two-dimensional zigzag just uh, on, on that, um, and th the point is it's, it's, a, it's actually a tricky problem, so for uh, many Monte Carlo methods, um, because, you know, here's your distribution, 
Uh, and essentially, the shape of the distribution is, is basically changing as you go around. Um, and the nice thing about the zigzag is, is, is it, in a local sense, it can very naturally, without any sort of complicated uh, adaptation, can very naturally kind of realize that it's, uh, that, um, that the kind of, you need to change your velocities, okay? And you've got, so you've got this multidimensional velocity you can actually do. This is actually quite a hard case, uh, uh, in, in, this, in no sense are the, the, li the natural lines in which the zigzag goes in the natural ones for this particular banana. But that was just a very, very <laughs> short run, um, which I might try and run again. It's, oh, it's still going. It's still going. Okay. So, um, so, this is, so this kind of example is much harder to do for, for something simple like the Metropolis algorithm. And if you were to do standard Hamiltonian MCMC on this kind of example, um, you would also have uh, severe problems. If you were to do some kind of souped-up versions um, like the Riemannian manifold um, uh, Hamiltonian MCMC, um, then you would, um, uh, then you might do better, but it would depend a lot on the tails of the distribution and, and things of that time. Um, so anyway, so it's interesting, and I, I'm, I'm glad I had the opportunity to tell you about it today. So thank you. Yeah, we, we think that it has some potential for multimodality. But in the same way, I mean, it, in HMC, people don't claim that it's really solving. I mean, nothing completely solves multimodality. But anything, we saw in the very first example, um, it has potential to, to, to certainly alleviate multimodality things because that velocity thing would just get you over the, over the, over the barrier. Yeah. You've got, you've, got, you've got lots of things to tweak. You can actually, so, so one thing you can do is you can actually have a velocity which um, is not constant. Um, if you just double the velocity, though, it doesn't buy you anything because this is a continuous time stochastic process, right? So actually it just tends, you just, if you double your velocity, you just have to jump at, the, at twice the rate. So in some sense, it doesn't really help you anything. Um, but if you actually have a, um, so for instance, if you have a heavy tail distribution, you can alleviate this by having, uh, um, trajectories which basically start by going slowly but then speed up as they're going and that will basically get you out of the tails quicker which will make, give you a much more r robust algorithm so there's lots we haven't explored half of that yet but there's lots lots to do on that yet but okay well thank you very much